The opposite of fear is bravery. Hmm. Nope. The opposite of fear is curiosity. Is the glass half empty? Is it half full? That misses the point. Elevating curiosity will help you see and understand what's in the glass. This is Applied Curiosity Lab Radio, the podcast of curiosity. In each episode, Becky Saltzman interviews unconventional thinkers and doers in her unconventional way to dissect and uncover what you can use to see things others miss, make better decisions, and apply your talents in new and profound ways. Elevate curiosity. Escape the boundaries of ordinary. And I'd be sitting in a bookstore and I'd just be reading, having fun. And I would literally hear a voice that say, you have to leave. And I would look around and I'd go, who the heck said that? And I would look up and I'd look behind me and I'd go, okay. And then I'd hear, you need to get out of here. And I'd get up and leave. Hello, curiosity seekers and adventurous thinkers. Welcome to episode one of Applied Curiosity Lab Radio. This is the first official episode, and I'm your host, Becky Saltzman. Each week, I will take curiosity, and I'll elevate it ahead of criticism, judgment, fear, and complacency, while I scan the universe for unconventional thinkers and doers from a wide range of topics, because this is the podcast for the relentlessly curious. We'll sometimes go deep in the weeds, but we will always extract actionable bits, wisdom, and insights that you can use in your own life. Okay, today is a unique episode in that not only is it our first episode, but it is also a double episode. It's an extra long episode. Feel free to listen to it all at once or break it up into small chunks. No one is bossing you around as to how you can listen to this episode, but don't miss it because this is truly fast. And if you've ever been curious about mental illness, hang out here with us because Julie is a world-renowned expert on the topic. But here's the twist. She is not a doctor, but doctors consult with her. She is not an academic, but she speaks at universities all over the world. She's not a Hollywood insider, but when it comes to mentally ill characters, she's the go-to consultant for roles like Claire Danes on Homeland. Julie's first hallucination was when she was 16 years old. Sitting in the library, a voice demanded, you have to leave. She then went on to live with untreated bipolar disorder for over 15 years until she was finally diagnosed with the illness at the age of 31. Since that time, she has devoted her career to educating people affected by the illness, especially healthcare professionals whose clients have bipolar disorder. Julie's four books are among the top selling of all time on managing mental illness, especially bipolar disorder and depression. She is an award-winning columnist. Her website, Bipolar Happens, is one of the top bipolar disorder websites in the world with over 1 million visitors. After tragic events like Sandy Hook, she's a go-to media expert on the role of mental illness and issues about gun control and violence, and not without controversy. She works as a coach for family members and partners of people with bipolar disorder. So we go deep into it, exploring topics like Aren't we all just a little crazy? And what do we mean by mental illness? What's the difference between mood disorder, personality disorders, psychotic disorders, or hallucinations, delusions, and conspiracy paranoia? How many of us are actually mentally ill? What is personality versus mental illness? And how do you see clues and patterns of behavior? Is mental illness genetic? How can you manage your own mental illness and how can you help others manage theirs? Why does Julie revoke her HIPAA rights? Why does she think she should not be allowed to have a gun? What does it mean when you sleep with three guys in one day, get so drunk that you black out, not sleep for two weeks, literally not sleep, quit your job and fly to China? What's it mean to think that you can sell anything, sleep with anyone and go anywhere? Stay tuned. And now please enjoy my conversation with Julie Fast. Hey, Julie. Good morning, Becky. Welcome to Apply Curiosity Lab Radio. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad you're here. I'm going to jump right into it because I want to make sure that we have an understanding of language that we're going to be using so that we're all on the same page. So according to the American Psychological Association, just under 20% of Americans, and particularly American adults, I think they talk about, have some kind of mental illness. 
So when we're talking about public policy, like gun control or HIPAA or some of these things, I want to make sure that we're all talking about the same thing. Because when we're talking about mental illness or mental disorder, what are we talking about and what should we be talking about? Well, first of all, you can expand that statistic because the World Health Organization has recently said that 25% of the world's population will experience a mental health episode at some time. So any statistic that you hear for the United States in terms of the big illnesses we will talk about today, such as the disorders, mood disorders, anxiety disorders, psychotic disorders, personality disorders, are consistent across the world. So it's not only the United States that has a mental health crisis, let's say, going on. It's the world itself. When we're talking about 20 or 25 percent, are we talking about the same thing. In other words, when people talk about things, and I don't want to necessarily just jump into policy necessarily, but I'm curious because I think it's important that we all are talking about the same thing. When we're talking about people with mental illness and gun control, for example, are we talking about that 25% or are we talking about a subset of that? And if so, how should we think about this? It's a great question because all statistics can be manipulated. If you look at the 25% statistic, what that's saying is that at some point in someone's life, they are going to have some kind of episode. It doesn't say that 25% of the world is diagnosed with one of the major psychiatric illnesses. So let's move back and break it down a bit. My co-author, Dr. John Preston, and I used the statistic for bipolar disorder that 4 to 6% of the world's population has diagnosed bipolar. There's an example. Whereas if you look at depression alone, you're getting into the 20, 25% of the world population having some form of depression. You then have personality disorders, borderline, narcissism, histrionic, hypochondria, now called anxiety, somatic disorder. You're looking at 5%, anywhere from 1% to 5% of the population. And psychotic disorders often are around 2 to 3%. Then you get to suicide rates. Within each illness, there's a different suicide rate. So it depends on what you're talking about, how you use these statistics. Within bipolar disorder, I know my statistics really well. So I'm real careful about that because I have to write books on it. But when you get into the larger issue, let's take PTSD. I think the statistics are incredibly fluid and are much, much worse than we actually say they are. So one thing I will say, I think we're underestimating the impact of mental illness in the world, not overestimating. How do we think about this? In other words, when we talk about, you know, we're talking about making policy around mental illness, whether it's research, whether it's HIPAA, whether it's gun control, should we be thinking about this kind of large 25% or do we need to parse it? And if we do need to parse it, how do we look at this? Can we look at all mental illness? For example, people say people who have mental illness should not have access to guns, for example, in this country, just as an example. Is that the 25% we're talking about or is that a subset? And how do we identify these people? How do we even begin to think about it? It's absolutely a subset and almost always it involves psychosis and violence. So you would have to move into looking into the illnesses that have psychosis and violent symptoms or the ability to be violent within an illness. So you're not normally just looking at depression. You're looking at psychotic disorders and and anything that affects a person's ability to make a reasonable decision in the moment. I define mental illness, which I call mental health disorders, first of all, as genetic. In my work and in my books, I work in the genetic realm. The people I write about are born with these illnesses. So once again, you get into statistics. There are genetic illnesses that run through family trees that are so easy to trace. Bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, anxiety, depression, for example, tend to run through family trees. Now people could say epigenetics, that's because you're born and you are raised by those family. But in the United States, for example, where we tend to have nuclear families, it's not a situation where cousins are raised with your, for example, yourself. You're not usually raised with your cousins in our society. And you will absolutely see children who have cousins and aunts and uncles and grandparents on branches of the family that don't live together who have these illnesses. Now, personality disorders tend to run in families environmentally. So there's an example of breaking things down from genetics to environment. I do believe, though, with the invention of the internet, I started my webpage in 2002, that we have so much more info now, I think we're starting to see that personality disorder symptoms, such as narcissism, for example, you absolutely can be born that way. So 
how do we define mental health disorders? Here's mine. It is a brain disorder that affects a person's ability to self-regulate the mood and behavior. It means that the brain makes decisions for the person. So for example, as a person with bipolar disorder, if something triggers me, I, Julie Fast, might go, that's okay. I can live with that. But my bipolar disorder brain is triggered and I'll start to cry. I could have a panic attack or I could get psychotic from something that the real me would walk away from. So I define mental health disorder as genetic brain-based illnesses. So when I say mental illness, it's not environmental for me. The environment comes in as triggers and it exacerbates the illnesses. So the 25%, I would go out on a limb here and say, absolutely, 25% of the world either deals with something genetic, depression, anxiety, psychosis, or mania. I absolutely believe that. So do we have to get a better understanding and grasp on these kind of idiosyncrasies within before we ever start thinking about policy or even, for example, research? The word idiosyncrasy, for example, brings up a really interesting point. You can have situational mood health changes, okay? So let's say your beloved partner dies and you go into a serious depression. That is not what I'm talking about when I say mental health disorder. That is a brain change from an event. Mental health disorders can exist whether something happens or not in my book. So if you're looking at an idiosyncrasy, you're talking personality for me. Mental health disorders tend to be episodic. They come and go. They can be charted very carefully, which means my bipolar disorder, for example, can very easily be written down. Idiosyncrasies, unhappiness, having life crises, et cetera, they're not as easy to chart. It's sort of all over the place. So I would not use the word idiosyncrasy to describe mental illness. I would use that to describe personality. And that's the big question. What is personality versus mental illness? Well, when you look at the DSM behind me, you know, three, four inches thick, right? The DSM-5. What percentage would you say of the things in that book should we be talking about when we're talking about mental illness or, or your, with your definition of mental illness? I was educated by my co-author. So I work with two men who are my mentors, Dr. John Preston and Dr. Jay Carter. And they are PsyDs. They travel around the world and actually lecture on mental health disorders and management. So they've sort of taught me over the last 13 years, a lot of stuff. I certainly read the DSM. I read all kind of big psych textbooks, and I think they're very good at listing symptoms. So for the illnesses that are considered genetic mental health disorders, the DSM works beautifully. You can open the DSM to, let's say, what an anxiety disorder looks like, and you can read it. It's an illness. You're born with it often. It runs in families. When you get to the personality stuff, and you start looking at things like cutting, for example, or suicidal ideation and all of that. Our society right now, because of what's happening on the internet, let's just look at what's happening. I don't know if you know about the blue whale thing that's going on right now, which is a sort of worldwide phenomenon where young children are killing themselves on a dare that's set up through an internet kind of app. It's happening all over the world. You have the 13 Reasons Why show on Netflix that's causing young kids to kill themselves. We have sort of an epidemic of mental health behavior that's happening in our world that we've never seen before. Is that part of society? Is that genetic? Does it mean that the internet has come in and helped kids who already had a predisposition to these kind of illnesses make decisions because an app was there to tell them to? So these questions of what is mental illness, what it is disorder, what is personality, I answer them by saying, look for patterns. I bet if I research the young people who are following these blue whale things or whatever you want to call them, there will be a pattern already there that someone was susceptible to something like that. That's just my, that's the way I see mental health disorders. My thing is I believe in a lot of charts, a lot of looking from birth until now and looking for patterns. Someone who, for example, has a crisis in life, they've been fine up to whenever, then they join the army and they go to Afghanistan and they get PTSD. That's a very different thing than mental illness. So I know I'm sort of going all over the place with your question because that is the problem 
we have right now. HIPAA, which is the Insurance Protection Act, which says somebody, anybody who is getting health care has pure privacy, has been a disaster for mental illness, the kind of that I work with, because the majority of people with severe mental health disorders lose their insight. So they say, I don't want treatment, even though they're lying in the gutter. How do we define mental illness to address that? Then you have something like the Murphy Bill, which Senator Murphy, who has come out of nowhere and sort of been the savior for so many families, he said, in cases of psychosis, we must revoke HIPAA. So that the, the distinguishing feature that removes HIPAA is psychosis. And how do you feel about that? Oh, I think it's fantastic. For myself, as a person with three psychiatric disorders, I have bipolar disorder, a psychotic disorder, an anxiety disorder, and a right brain injury, just to add it all up. I absolutely revoke my rights when I'm sick. I want the people around me to take care of me. I've been so psychotic that I thought I was being filmed and that I was an alien in a human body being filmed driving down the street. Is that someone who is able to make their own decisions about whether they're sick or not? So I revoke my rights. But there's, Becky, it's so interesting because now you're seeing as we sit here, I'm hearing myself go off, off on these tangents of here's what mental illness is and here's what we need with HIPAA. This is the problem. There are no definitions. And so maybe, maybe what we can do is go back to the beginning and say, when we start to treat mental illnesses as physical illnesses and remove so much of the stuff that goes on around them, this is a, an emotional failing, it's how your dad raised you, it's because you took these drugs, pull out the actual physical illnesses, that's where the DSM comes in in many cases or any type of manual or any of my books. Let's talk about that separately from the typical emotional mental health behavior that we all have. I know you said you think you're going off on all these tangents, but I think that it's really important because when we talk about mental illness, I think we might be talking about so many things that the definition becomes useless. It's so amorphous that we can't you can't make policy on something that is so amorphous. And that's what I was trying to understand. You know, I think about global warming, for example, and the word global warming or the use of the term. And, when you know, the minute it's cold, people say, oh, it's, you know, there's no global warming. It's cold out instead of climate change or climate catastrophe. And I think maybe the use of the word mental illness is kind of a barrier to actually creating policy that we can use to address that. So it's helpful. I, I appreciate the way you've unpacked it. And particularly, it's interesting to think of the Murphy Bill and the trigger being psychosis, because that's something that's a lot more tangibly measured than mental illness, for example, especially when you throw in personality disorders and all that stuff. But that makes me think of a question, you know, you're an expert asked all the time. What is the question you're asked the most? And what is the question you should be asked the most? The first question I'm asked is, doesn't everybody have a mental illness? Doesn't everybody have a form of bipolar disorder? Aren't we all a little bit crazy? And that's where it gets back to what we're talking about right now. I started having symptoms when I was 16 years old. I'm in my 50s now. It is so easy for me to go back to my first psychotic episode at age 16, because it used to happen in bookstores. And I'd be sitting in a bookstore and I'd just be reading, having fun. And I would literally hear a voice that say, you have to leave. And I would look around and I'd go, who the heck said that? And I would look up and I'd look behind me and I'd go, okay. And then I'd hear, you need to get out of here. And I'd get up and leave. And for many years, I didn't know that those were oral hallucinations. I've had them since I was 16 years old. We can measure mental health disorders. So if someone says to me, everybody has a form of bipolar disorder, this is what I say. Have you ever been in a situation where you felt so perfect that your ability to make rational judgment was completely gone and you thought it was okay to sleep with three guys in one day, get so drunk that you blacked out, but still think it was fun, not sleep for almost two weeks, quit your job and fly to China? Because that's the definition of a euphoric manic episode. And if you've experienced something like that, then yes, you have bipolar disorder. But I doubt you will find somebody who has a pattern of that behavior since age 17, like myself, that's interspersed then 
with episodes where you can't get out of bed, you think you're worthless, you cry all day long, you have panic attacks, you feel like dying, and you actually try to kill yourself. That's another definition of bipolar disorder. There is a huge difference between mood disorder and moodiness. Doesn't everyone have a form of bipolar disorder? Because they think that we have our up mood and our down mood. And what they don't understand is bipolar disorder simply means energy. So mania, for example, the one of that there's two mood swings in bipolar disorder, mania and depression, that just means high energy. It can be incredibly negative. And our low mood can be extremely active. It's called agitated depression. So there's a lot of misunderstanding. Human nature can't be charted. I really believe that. Mental health disorders can be charted. They're no different than diabetes. We can measure them in the same way we can take blood sugar levels. Now, there's not a blood test for bipolar disorder, for example, but there's absolutely a set of questions, a set of physical changes, and a set of behaviors you can talk about and absolutely determine. Well, why do you think that there's not a blood test for bipolar disorder? Because it's not a blood, it's not, it doesn't exist in the blood as we know. We don't even know what gene causes bipolar disorder. There's a lack of research that's astonishing. If you think about the fact four to 6% of the world population having an illness, now here's a statistic, 20% average 20% sort of suicidal rate with bipolar disorder, much higher death rate than many, many, many illnesses. There's not a lot of research. And I think your questions are getting to that because maybe one of the problems, and you know, I'm not, I'm not a university researcher. My specialty is management. I'm moving more into research now because so many people are reading my observations And in fact, right now, I'm part of a research study at Southern Methodist University to see if we can measure mania in the eyes. So it's a big, big thing. Maybe the problem, Becky, is that we do not have a clear enough definition of what we are trying to treat. In my head and in my world, I understand what bipolar is. I educate it. And once someone sees one of my talks, they'll come up and they'll go, oh, my grandma had that, or I have that, or my sister had that. It's very defined. Whereas if you just throw those words out there, mental illness, narcissism, bipolar, schizophrenia. Well, also people diagnose it all the time. So, you know, they'll look at the president, they'll look at Donald Trump and they'll say, oh, he's mentally ill. And people will say, yeah, you know, he really has some traits of mental illness as if we're diagnosticians or as if we're using that as some kind of negative thing to throw at him. Like if you have mental illness, that's the same as you're a liar and a cheater and you have mental illness. So why would you want to do research or treat something that is similar to being a liar, cheater, or bad person? But the difference is though there is the difference between untreated mental health disorders and treated. So anybody who talks about Donald Trump and narcissism, he fits every single category you could possibly imagine for narcissism. But narcissism is very, very interesting because narcissism doesn't necessarily mean you don't have a life. Personality disorders such as the sociopath, which is the lack of empathy, sociopath, psychopath, now called antisocial personality disorder, lack of empathy, or narcissism, et cetera, people are extremely high functioning. So one of the problems with those in terms of definition is you can have all those symptoms, but you can still have kids and wives and money and do whatever you want. In my world, the world of the anxiety, psychotic, and mood disorders, because my world, I don't like to work in personality disorders as much as I have to. Why don't you like? Oh, so nebulous. Whereas if you give me a good bipolar or a good schizophrenia, schizoaffective anxiety disorder, I can literally talk to somebody for five minutes and tell them what they experience, empathize, sympathize, and give them a management plan that works. When we're talking about mental illness, we're also talking about personality disorder. So how do we say X number of dollars are allocated for mental illness research and we need to allocate more when we don't even really know what we're talking about? The money allocated for breast cancer research versus suicide. And yet, what does suicide research look like? One of the reasons I like to talk to you, Becky, because this is a podcast about curiosity. This is not a podcast about bipolar disorder, right? So I'm not in my comfort zone here, and I love that. Because if I'm interviewed in mental illness, they will ask me the typical mental illness questions. What's this? What's that? What's the symptoms? How do you treat it? You're actually asking me, how do we change the fact that mental health disorders are woefully underfunded? They are not understood. They are not studied. And yet millions and millions and millions of people in the world are dying from them. 
So how about if we step back a minute and say, first of all, we must define what constitutes a mental health disorder. I understand where that comes from. So for me, I say start with genetic stuff. If you start with the genetic stuff that runs through families, that can be measured through a list that you literally check off, you can diagnose bipolar disorder from a list very easily. Most people don't like that. They don't like to do the list and they don't like to talk about it. Is that the same? Has that been consistent? Bipolar disorder has not changed. In fact, Hippocrates talked about bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder is one of the most ancient illnesses in the world. It has not changed in any way. And more adults do not have bipolar than they used to. The increase in diagnosing children was where the controversy was, not adults. Interesting. So if you are to say, okay, let's let's just segment out just the things you're calling it genetic as measured by- They're born by... with it and family history. Right. But not, not genomic. It's not yet. I specialize in management plans. So I mentioned before Jay Carter and John Preston, they are my mentors, resources, et cetera. So if I need research, I write them. They are the researchers. They send it to me. I study it and I put it in my books. My books are not research heavy. And that's sort of interesting. They don't need to be because my specialty is bipolar disorder, schizoaffective disorder which means mood disorder. So I am a mania, depression, anxiety, and psychosis specialist. I, I have all of that. I treat it myself. Are those, what percentage of those genetic kinds of disorders are you talking about? Are it's those very, disorders? Yeah, it is is large. that a the large biggest percentage? Of all of mental health disorders is depression without question. But you'd be astonished how much psychosis there is. For example, psychosis simply means a break with reality. It's where you either have a hallucination, which is a sensual, So the eye, the nose, the mouth, the ears, or the skin feels, sees, tastes, or thinks something is there physically that isn't there. That's the voice. Julie, get out of the store. Right. Then you have delusions that are everywhere. Paranoia is your main delusion. Conspiracy theorists, those who are really into it, who have no basis in what they're doing, almost always have some form of a paranoid disorder. Now, here's the next thing. Let's say you and I sit down and we're going to take a piece of paper. Let's define mental health disorder so that we can get better research. I actually love this idea and I'm going to take you up on it and I'm going to write something. The next thing is, is that mental health disorders always, there are no exceptions, affect a person's ability to work and have rational thought and maintain relationships. When you're in the world I live in of bipolar, schizophrenia, anxiety, and those disorders, you will always see fractured relationships, troubled relationships, lots of drug and alcohol use, and work problems, but they will be episodic. Mm -hmm. So when you move into personality disorders, which is why you hear me go, oh man, personality disorders, personality disorders are completely different even though they share some of the same symptoms of the more genetic-based family-oriented illnesses, they are consistent over time. So a personality disorder such as borderline is considered to be woven into the personality of the person. So it's not episodic. People with bipolar disorder can look like they have bipolar at certain times, but then they'll come out of it and go back to stability. So schizophrenia, bipolar, and anxiety disorders in almost all cases, will have periods of stability. Personality disorders means your behavior is consistent over time. It's not episodic and you will not have chunks of it. Are the genetic mental disorders primarily episodic or you can't make that distinction? No, they're episodic. Bipolar disorder is called an episodic mood but disorder. But what about other, some of the other, you know, schizophrenia or some of the other genetic disorders, mental disorders? Depending on who has it, it can be more chronic. That's where the word chronic comes in. But otherwise, yes, bipolar disorder, anxiety disorders, and psychotic disorders absolutely come and go. Should we talk about those disorders, the disorders that you create management programs for? Should we be talking about those disorders in a digestible, easier language that is extracted out of the term mental illness? Why? So here, so I I understand that question. So that we're not equating. So that's a terminology question then. So that's why I say mental health disorder. I just did a big article for Psychology Today about Chris Cornell suicide. Mm-hmm. And I got quite a few responses from people who say, we no longer say he took his life, he killed himself. 
we want to change the language of suicide. He suicided or he died by suicide. That makes a lot of sense to me. And I wrote every person. I can't answer. I get hundreds of emails. But these people I wrote back because it was some big names who wrote me. And I said, thank you. I need to change my language because if I kill myself from bipolar, I have not killed myself. Bipolar killed me. It is no different than dying from cancer. So died by suicide is an example of that's truly what is going on. When someone with a mental health disorder kills themselves, almost always they are not in their right mind. They are often psychotic, hearing voices, having thoughts that are not real, thinking that they don't mind, that they don't matter in the world. All of that to me is meant that means you your mind is not working. So suicide, he died by suicide makes sense. We tried to use the word brain disorder. I watched for many years a lot of organizations trying to say brain disorder. It just didn't pick up for some reason. Yeah. So I decided to combine the two. I'm very conscious of my words. I say mental health disorder. Mental is a derogatory word for some people. But the truth is, what else are we going to call this? This is our mind. So if we wanted to say mind disorder, then that also is confusing. So I stick with mental health disorder. As long as people understand how that's different from mental illness in general. For example, you say that with personality disorder, you don't love dealing with personality disorder. It's that's not my not, thing. It's not. And that's and often if you're not an expert in something, you're not you know what your limitations are. The truth is, though, is that in my coaching business, for example, 50 percent of my work is with personality disorder. When you have a genetically based illness that runs in families that can be helped with medications and true changes in life such as bipolar, schizophrenia, and anxiety. You can say to somebody, here's the symptoms. If you do this, this symptom will happen. And it's across the board. For example, in bipolar, if you don't have circadian rhythm-based sleep, it is very, very rare that you'll be stable. If you take a night job, you will be sick. Hundreds of years, hundreds of years of documentation of the role of sleep in bipolar disorder. So one of my main ways I manage this horrific illness is I go to bed at the same time every night. Even if I feel like partying, even if I've met a new guy, I'm in bed by midnight, asleep by midnight, but in bed usually by 1030. So boring, but I know it works. When you move into personality disorders, it doesn't work like that. They're more emotionally based. They're often trauma based, and they're much more based on who the person is. So it's not that I dislike working with personality disorders. It's that it's hard. Got it. So you have $50 million Ah. and you're going to allocate it in a very specific way. And with all the 25% of the world's population with some form of mental illness, what do you do with that $50 million? It's pretty easy for me. I teach people what a regular thought is and what a thought that's related to a mental health disorder is. I already have the plan. So. My next book is a book for children. So many people think children cannot have mental health disorders. And the reality is that children can have extremely severe mental health disorders. In fact, most of the beds in the psychiatric units in the United States are filled. So there are not enough even beds for kids with psychiatric disorders. I do not believe this is because we have an increase in psych disorders. It's just that more people are getting help. That's my opinion. If you are a child and you have the thought, I want to die, Very rarely does a child have a thought, I want to die. But what they need to know is if you have that thought, I want to die, and four-year-olds can have that thought, three-year-olds can have that thought, and as they get older, they can have that thought a lot. Parents tell me this all the time. If we have a plan in place in schools, if we have a policy plan which is no different than if you fall off the playground in a merry-go-round and you see a bone sticking out of your leg, You go tell somebody, I have broken my ankle, broken my leg, I need help. It's exactly the same. If you have the thought, I want to die, that's okay. It means that your brain chemicals are producing ideas that are not necessarily indicative of how you actually feel. Let's go talk to somebody and work on writing your brain chemicals. Now, a lot of people say to me, but what about expression? And you're telling people how to be, whatever. And I don't care. My whole goal is to prevent what I see in my work which is parents calling me when they're in their 40s and the child's in their 20s and the child was suicidal at age five, but a therapist said it's impossible for a child to be suicidal. So I would take that $50 million and use it in quite a few ways. 
The first thing is I would start an educational system in our school that says, here's what brain health looks like. I want to die is actually a normal thought for a lot of people who have brain disorders. It's okay. I experience it all the time. It means that your brain's out of whack. Let's go talk to somebody about it. It doesn't have to be medications that you use. Let's learn how not to act on it. That's number one. Has to be done with children. If you have, for example, a child who has hypersexuality, no one wants to talk about it. Let's be honest. There are children who are hypersexual, which means they take off all of their clothes. They try to touch other children and they're eight years old and they have no idea why it's wrong. Let's say there are some illnesses such as childhood onset bipolar disorder where young children do this. Let's be open about it. Educate the schools. So school first, without question. The next thing is, is I would build work centers so that people with mental health disorders can find meaningful work. So I would start at the beginning and then I'd reach the middle. Our inability to work is devastating. I am gravely disabled by my mental illnesses. I cannot work full time. Many, many people with these illnesses are on disability as compared to people with physical illnesses. Because we are taught in our society, you either go do your nine to five thing or you're an entrepreneur. There's sort of not something in between for those of us who are quite brilliant, because many people with mental health disorders are abnormally intellectual, but we can't fit into being a doctor or a professor or whatever. So a lot of us flounder. I'm lucky because I hit the internet boom right in the moment because I'm an entrepreneur. But many of my friends with mental health disorders, you're looking at 40, 50 jobs, and it's not because they can't do the job. We are not intellectually affected by our illnesses. It's that we can't handle the workspace or what's around it. So I would create a type of work and job center where those of us with mental health disorders can learn it's okay to work 20 hours a week and spend the next 20 hours on self-care. We are disabled. There's two things in mental health that we don't want to talk about. We don't want to talk about the sphere disability that most of us go through. For example, people with bipolar that have a very high rate of going to college, but almost all of them drop out. It's an enormous dropout rate. So you have this intellectual desire to work and go to school with the inability to manage the illness to make it happen. And the next thing is we never talk about the violence that is in so many of these illnesses. And I see it every single day in society where someone with a mental health disorder has committed a violent act and our mental health community, instead of embracing that as I do, because I get violent in my mood swings, instead of embracing it and saying, this is part of who we are, let's treat it. People say people with mental health disorders are not typically violent. That's an aberration. Uh, so there's, those are the things. So I'd start with childhood education on that's what the brain is. That's what my next book is about. I'd then take the money and build job centers where those of us with mental health disorders are not embarrassed that we can't work full time. And then I would work on the violence problem that we have. I would have put a pin in that because I do want to get to the question of guns, because I think some of your ideas are different than a lot of people in your field. So I'd like to to touch on that. But before I do that, the $50 million question and your answer to it, and I have a curious question, because when you're looking at $50 million for a specific kind of cancer research, you're looking at the cellular level. And the reason you're looking at that are probably three things. One, to create a drug to cure it, maybe for a genetic research to see if you can stop it or to treat it. You're not looking at that for people who have terminal cancer to find ways to live with that terminal cancer. When you take the $50 million for mental health, your answer was entirely management. Because that's my specialty. Yeah, that's a good point. That's your, that's your specialty. How do we look at mental illness in a similar way to cancer or in your example, a broken, broken bone? Broken brain, broken bone. What are the goals? What would you like to see in the science, the research of mental illness? What would be the ideal? Is it to find a way to manage it? Is it to find a way to cure it? Is it to find the way to do kind of genetic manipulation to prevent it? And I know that your area is management, and my God, you're the expert in that area. So I can see why that question was answered that way. But are we comparing apples to apples when we're looking at using money for curative or investigating kind of on a molecular level versus managing it in society? The brain is the most complicated organ of the body. It not only has neurotransmitters that affect mental illness, dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, It also controls the movement of the body, the stomach, the arms, the legs, et cetera. 
So when you do any type of medication on the brain, the side effects of medication are literally so overwhelming that the majority of people will not use them. As my co-author John often says, there is no way to harpoon a medication to the brain. When a person with a mental health disorder takes a drug, it always, always works in some way. So antipsychotics are some of the most brilliant medications ever created. I would take them if I could. Lithium, which is not even a created drug, which is a salt, is one of the most brilliant, brilliant things that you have in the world. The problem is that those of us with brain disorders get physical symptoms from our drugs that are so severe that the majority of people will not take the drugs unless forced. Or I have taught myself because of weight gain, losing teeth, which I'm showing you right now. I lost four teeth to psych drugs. The fact that you have serotonin in the head and you also have it in the stomach, which means any drug that you take for serotonin can literally give you stomach problems to the point that you barf and poop and sweat and cry all at the same time. It's called coming out of every orifice, just goop. I'm being honest here. I used to, I have a friend named Dave Mowry who wrote a book with Tara Rolstad called No Really, We Want You to Laugh. And it's called, it's for mental health stand-up comedy, which is a big movement in our field. The jokes about side effects, it's like we need to carry around a toilet paper roll with us. Imagine having a severe mental illness where you also have the signs of a colon problem. It is indescribable how serious the side effects are on meds. So why not teach management with mild meds? It's what I do. Mental illness, mental health disorders can be managed with lifestyle changes and trigger management to the point that you need maybe half the meds you would normally need. We are not teaching this right now. Instead, we literally say, there's nothing for you or take this drug. I come in and I say, as a child, I'm going to teach you that I want to die is not a crazy, horrible, disgusting thing to happen. It's your brain chemistry doing what an adult brain can do in a child. It means you need to ask for help and maybe something's wrong with your brain chemistry. You don't need a drug for something like that. So I'm not only advocating cognitive behavioral therapy, which would be a part of it, but also a lifestyle that helps you manage mental illness. There's nothing for bipolar disorder except my books. It blows my mind. Is that right? Absolutely. So for personality disorder, borderline, for example, there's something called DBT, which is dialectical behavioral therapy, which is wonderful for borderline. It's a massive lifestyle change. Dialectical behavioral therapy is, my co-author John explains it the best. One reason borderline is so hard to treat is that borderline is a personality disorder that involves the emotional in an emotional rush that's so overwhelming that you will act out in any way possible to get the emotions to go down. Mm -hmm. DBT teaches you, here comes an emotion. Don't act yet. There's a middle ground. What can I do? Can I breathe? What is the actual situation? There's all kind of stuff in that middle. So John describes it as there's one column, two column, three column. In column one, your boyfriend says he doesn't care about you for. Column three is, oh my God, I'm going to cut myself and bleed out in front of him on the floor. That'll show him. That's a borderline kind of thing. DBT says, wait a minute. Let's just, okay, let's just feel that emotion. Let's deal with it. Let's find other ways to go through it so that you don't have to cut yourself and bleed out on the floor in front of them. It works. Bipolar disorder is different because even though we can use some forms of DBT, we have so many other symptoms besides that. I call bipolar the garbage pail illness. <laughs> so mania because you will have this symptom, it's okay for me to have three boyfriends, to sneak them into my parents' house, to have sex in the backyard, to drink 15 beers, and to quit my job and fly to China. There's a lack of insight where DBT will never touch it. So my specialty is prevention, where you learn the first sides of mania. Oh, this picture is really bright. I'm going into a manic episode, so I better stop it. So that's my health card system. So they're equivalent to DBT. It's the only thing I know of on the market. Bipolar disorder is not an emotional illness. That's a big mistake people make. It's a symptom-based illness. It's no different than diabetes. We list our symptoms. So research needs to go into managing the actual symptoms way before, way before we need more research and better drugs. So for example, in the research I'm doing with the fabulous group of people at Southern Methodist University, I'm part of a graduate study, a woman 
read my article for BP Magazine for Bipolar, which is a wonderful magazine, about three signs for recognizing mania in the eyes. What if, just like now, you can take a little blood prick and put a little piece of paper in it, tells you your blood sugar rating. What if we actually have physical changes in the eyes that show if we're euphoric manic or dysphoric manic? And one day we invent a scanner and it goes, sorry, you got seven of the 10 markers of, of euphoric hypomania, you're euphoric hypomanic. It takes away the emotion. What you're saying, and, and I want to get to your cards and the management now, because you have to have a way to, how do I see it coming? Have to. It's not taught at all. How do I see it coming is step one. Mm-hmm. That's not step one. Ah. It's so interesting because step one is an internal observation where you become your own detective. I teach people with any mental health disorder, I don't care, I don't care if it's borderline, if you're told you have narcissism, you need to change. It's an internal watching of the self. Constantly? Constant. I don't ever take a break from watching myself. It's how I'm not dead. Is it exhausting? It, it gets extremely exhausting, but otherwise I'd be dead. So eventually you have to have to make decisions. This morning, as I was getting ready for this interview, I was looking in the mirror. This had nothing to do with this interview, actually. And I went, holy crap, I have so many mental illnesses. And I, I look in the mirror and you can't see it. I have this long hair. I have a regular looking face. I don't look sick. And yet I've been sick as a dog for the last couple of weeks because of a trigger of having to change a book deal. You can't see that I have trouble getting out of bed. You can't see that I have literally every single day have to have to open my computer and not have a panic attack. You can't see it. Would it be helpful if I could? Absolutely. Because just like with that broken ankle, I remember I have a lot of physical problems and I was in a wheelchair once because I used to be this athlete and I was always breaking things and hurting things. And I remember being pushed in, an a in a wheelchair and people going, oh, what happened? And I'm like, no one has ever done that for my bipolar. Mm -hmm. No one has ever said, wow, it must be hard to have one of the worst mental illnesses in the whole world. Look at how we treat schizophrenia. You and I live in Portland, Oregon. There are so many people on the street right now with schizophrenia that it's blowing my mind because our rent prices have gone up here, as you know. I'm watching the increase of the mentally ill on our streets, just lying there in the gutter, basically, talking to themselves with long, dirty fingernails, because we have a society that doesn't see it as a physical illness. If someone were lying in the street with a big swollen ankle with a bone sticking out, literally every single person in the neighborhood would walk around and go, oh my gosh, let's get him to a doctor. Whereas I go up to someone with schizophrenia, with their rotting teeth, and because this is the bad form of the illness, or pushing around a bag lady, which is a form of schizophrenia, pushing this around. I buy food, I talk, I do whatever. We do nothing. But how do we teach ourselves when we have a mental illness like that? How do we teach ourselves to be, to do that? What do you call, what do you, is there a name that you call that self, -ref, constant self reflection, which sounds exhausting? It is exhausting, but I, there's something very exciting about it to me. I, I love this topic more than anything. And you and I both love big data. So this is basically money ball for bipolar is what I call it because anxiety, schizophrenia, and mood disorders, those are our three main disorders I specialize in. Once again, I, I want to reiterate that versus personality disorder, which tends to be much harder for internal spotting. We always have periods of downtimes where we are not sick. Nobody with bipolar, for example, has an entire life of the same mood, mood swing. Actually, you can never say nobody with anything. Let's say the majority. We will always, always have moments of insight. That's why so many people with bipolar stay in relationships is because they'll have the insight and go, oh my God, what just happened? Please help me. Or, oh my God, just what happened? That will never happen again. So is it important to understand how to use those moments of insight? That is. So in that moment, I remember in 1997, when I started writing the health cards, I was so sick. I had been diagnosed with bipolar at 31. I couldn't work here. I'd had this amazing job in Japan. I just come back from China. I thought I was going to be a professor. I was a writer. I literally was so sick. I couldn't work. And I sat down and I said, darn it. The meds made me gain 80 pounds. I have acne. My eyebrows are growing weird. I have to find something else. The meds are not working for me. Now, Becky, I want to stress medications are required for most people with severe mental illness. I take my lithium. I take my medications, but I don't take them all of the time. I use them judiciously during serious mood swings because I have a form of the illness where I can do that. Not everyone can do that. And I said, there must be a better way. 
And as though it came, I remember looking into the skies and going, where is this coming from? I took out a pen and I said to myself, if I could just get the big picture, if I could just see what bipolar actually is, maybe I could manage it. There were maybe, I'm not kidding, maybe six books on bipolar disorder on the market at that time. Most of them were memoirs. There's a woman named Mary Ellen Copeland. I always love to mention her. She now does what's called the RAP program, which is a wonderful program. She was one of the first people I ever remember. She had a workbook. And I remember going, wait a minute, a workbook. That means I can do something. And at that point, I never read another bipolar disorder book again until I started my own radio show years ago because I didn't want to be influenced. I said, I want to find out about myself. And so I sat down and I had the luxury of being in a relationship for 10 years of somebody with bipolar one, I bipolar two. So I watched him and I watched myself and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I still have, it was a yellow notepad way before the kind of computers we use. And I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I went, wait a minute. I say the same thing every time I get manic. Could I tell my mom what to look for so that she won't let me buy a $5,000 chair? Okay, let me let me understand how this works. So you sat there and you had a moment between episodes yes. because one of the one of the benefits is the episodic. So the you sure as hell better use that moment of episodic non-manic or non-depressed Depressed. to do something to assess it. And you set up something where you would track and you would continue to track even as you were going out of that non-manic you track for 13, 13 years. years. Now, when you were manic or depressed, did you ever deviate from tracking or you were still able to kind of track? When you asked me about why, what I would do with my $50 million, the reason I would do something with work is that all of us are built with special talents, whether it be working with our hands as a carpenter. My talent is I'm a system writer. From the time I was a little girl, I would look at something and go, that's not very well done. And I remember getting out my pens and paper and going, let's chart it and do it this way. When I taught English in Japan in the early 90s, late 80s, I went, this is crazy how we're teaching English. So I wrote in English, a teaching plan, taught the whole school how to do it, and then traveled around Japan teaching my ESL plan. But in typical bipolar fashion, I dropped that when another idea came along and never went forward with it in the way that I could. That's another bipolar thing. So I think I'm a combination of a certain kind of mind. Engineer writer. Engineer writer who then realized she had severe bipolar. Let's say somebody was an artist who then got bipolar. They are going to show their art. Their bipolar will come out in their art. Mine came out in systems. So the health cards were not my first system I'd ever created. Bipolar, schizophrenia, and anxiety are big data illnesses. If you get enough of your own big data, you can manage it. So why wouldn't you use that $50 million to do a Fitbit for symptoms? Because I'm not, that's so interesting you say that. I was just talking to another person. I have a book I recommend called Better, Smarter, Richer by Jackie Babicki Peterson. And I met with Jackie the other day. She asked me the same question. It's because I'm a creator and I'm not a developer. I have a big problem personally that has nothing to do with bipolar, which is I have 5 million ideas. I know how to hire people to manage myself and my work. I have a wonderful manager. But you, for example, are more of a product developer. So People with bipolar disorder must get better at business. We must learn to work with others to help us. We must learn how to get grants and how to work when we're well to have things set up for when we're sick. So the reason I didn't answer the question that way is that I don't think that way, Mm -hmm. which is why I must hire somebody to help me get the health cards out into the world more. Do the health cards that you develop, do you, and I want to get, I want to delve into that actually, do, do the people who use those, the people that use those health cards, are they required to be as methodical and recording their own symptoms as someone like you? That's a fantastic question because the health cards are too advanced for most people who have an illness, which is why the majority of my work is with family members and partners. Because the health cards have three sections. The first is what you think, say, and do during a mood swing. The middle section is what I can do for myself. And the third is you telling the people in your life how they can help. One day I was with my former partner, Ivan, and he was very depressed. And he said, give me a hug. And I remember thinking, God, when I'm depressed, I don't want to be touched. And I went, oh my gosh, wrote it down. So on my health card, which you can read his health card and mine in the book, it says, ask me to go for a walk when I'm depressed. His says, hug me. So our symptoms were exactly the same. 
but what we needed to get better was completely different. People will often say, Julie, the health cards, I could just make three columns and do that. Why are you selling these? And I'd say, but that's not, that's not the point. The point is, is when you get the health cards, there's thousands of symptoms already listed that you literally just take your highlighter and you go, oh, everyone who's manic is the same. And then you'll read how I help myself, how I ask others to help. And you'll go, nah, I don't want to take a, a, a walk when I'm depressed. Mm-hmm. I like to curl up with some hot cocoa and watch a movie. So people who use them blow my mind. They will send me. There's a young girl I'm working with now. She's about 20, had a horrible psychotic manic episode where she had to leave school, sent me a health card for a trip she was taking. And in the first column, in her handwriting, it shows her writing down her thoughts. The car is too busy. I need to get out. I can't ride with my parents. Will I hurt their feelings? Middle column. I can ask to ride in a different car. Third column. Please don't take it personally if I say I can't ride in your car. And I just went, That's the most beautiful thing I've ever read in my life. That's data. So when I had to let go of an artist on a book in the last couple of weeks, I went into an extremely severe depression that was so severe. I was suicidal. I didn't want to live. All I want to do was lie in bed, take drugs and die. But my health cards were there. And what the health cards said, when you're suicidal, all you want to do when you're depressed is lie in bed, eat sugar, take drugs and die you're sick. It's not real. So every single day for a week, and I couldn't work very much. I had to put off a lot of stuff. I remembered what my health card said, get out of bed. I remembered what my book, Get It Done When You're Depressed said, be your own drill sergeant, think like an athlete. And I'd be lying in bed and I'd go, get up, get up, get up. You have to get up. And I'd visualize the health cards. You must answer your phone, open your email, ask for help, call your therapist, all listed. And if we can get people to make their own little plan like that, whether it comes from a parent or a healthcare professional or partner, they will read it when they're sick. And it speaks to them and says, you're sick right now. You don't need to die. You don't need to leave your wife and kids. You don't need to quit your job. You need to focus on managing bipolar first. Julie Fast is a mental health guru and best-selling author. You can find her at juliefast.com. This is fantastic. Isn't this an unbelievably intense topic to think that you and I are sitting here having this conversation about something that really should have been worked out a long time ago? We're a little behind. Yeah, we are. And I think I I suspect that there are some reasons for it. Here's a story of stigma. I often work with families where a parent will say, we can't tell the world he has bipolar disorder or take him to the doctor because it will be on his work record. And I'm like, You have a child who is paranoid, smoking pot. Oh, gosh, pot. There's another topic these days. Smoking pot. You literally have him locked in your house. And instead of using my system to work with the police and work with a crisis intervention team and take him to the hospital, you hope he can wait it out so that it doesn't go on his record. That's called self-stigma. And that's the belief of the person who either has the illness or loves someone with the illness, that it's so embarrassing and so devastating that you can't let the world know. I'm loud and proud about my bipolar. So we had the gay movement, you know, the LBGT, you know, community. I've watched what they do. I model what they do because what they have said is you're going to live with us. You might not like it, but you're going to live with us. We are who you are. We're 10% or more of the population. We must start doing that with bipolar. So I would, I would literally walk down the street wearing a shirt named Bi- said bipolar 20 years ago. Now, lots of people do it. So we are changing. This is what I love about curiosity, because you can ask any question out of curiosity and there shouldn't be fear. It should be, you, sh- you don't need to be courageous. You just need to be curious. Yes. That's why I don't worry about so many topics in any of these conversations kind of going all over the place. You know, it's, it's, dil- it's for dilettantes, right? It's fun. It's right? Fun. It's fun. I love it. Now, a couple of questions. I want to I want to make sure that I touch get a little bit of definition on this whole bipolar because I know there's bipolar one and bipolar two, and I want to make sure if you were wearing a shirt, would it say one, two, one and a half, three? What would it say? Bipolar disorder is a mood disorder that affects a person's ability to regulate the mood, self regulate the mood. So I'll, I teach a class called Psych Four by Four. I'll do it really quickly. There are four main types of psychiatric disorders: mood disorders, 
psychotic disorders, anxiety disorders, and personality disorders. Mood disorders only have two things, depression called unipolar depression and bipolar. That's it. So bipolar is a mood disorder. The only thing that separates unipolar from bipolar is mania, period, no exceptions. So basically, we are talking about a mania illness with bipolar. That's the first thing to remember. So the definition of bipolar 1 or bipolar 2 has to do with mania. People with bipolar disorder all have the same depression. So our symptoms will be the same. Severity can vary greatly. But you will find around the world depression is the same. You either have weepy depression or agitated depression, the same. The difference in bipolar 1 and bipolar 2 is mania. Now, picture a box and you have bipolar disorder. And I think it's like a Venn diagram or something, right? You can, you can put, that's the beauty of bipolar is that you literally can chart everything in this illness. It is not nebulous. Treatment is hard, but the, the illness is like a computer program. It is so easy to track. So bipolar disorder is depression and mania. And mania simply means energy. That's what's important to remember. It means increased energy. The number one symptom of mania is less sleep without being tired. So if someone says, I have bipolar, I ask them about sleep first, and they'll say, sometimes I stay up all night and sleep the whole next day. I'm like, sorry, dude, not bipolar. Because with mania, you stay up all night and stay up all the next day. You're not tired. So that's the number one hallmark. The next thing is, is an increase in goal-driven activities, which can be negative or positive, can be violent, homicidal, or extremely creative. You also have hypersexuality, hyperspending. And the reason is, is that as Dr. Jay Carter, the author of The Complete Idiot's Guide to Bipolar Disorder, teaches, your frontal lobe, peak just turns off when you're manic. So it's a very exciting time. I actually have a speech called uh, Lightning in a Bottle, Five Sales Secrets from a Manic Mind. Because people who are manic, especially the kind of manic that we consider upbeat and positive called euphoric mania. We can sell anything, sleep with anyone and go anywhere because there's not a voice in our head that says, wait, what? You're going to what? It's gone. We value euphoric mania in our society. We value euphoric mania, but euphoric mania, what goes up must come down. So it never really stays around as much as we'd like it to. So bipolar one and bipolar two are about mania. So there are two types of mania euphoric and dysphoric. Nobody talks about the dysphoric. Euphoric is hypersexual, fun, traveling the world, extremely creative, excited, bright eyes. That's when I, with my mania study, I see a film across my eyes that sparkles. Um, My eye colors change. Your body goes back. Your skin always clears up. It's very rare to see bad skin with mania. You have beautiful flowing hair. You wear lots of beautiful clothes and you walk in the room like you own it, which means you do. So I've often taught myself when I'm depressed to act like I'm manic. That's how I can give speeches when I'm depressed is that I I pull in this manic energy, which is I'm going to act like I am the world's greatest speaker and then I can be. Dysphoric is the combination of a low mood with high energy. It's by far the most serious downswing or serious symptom of bipolar disorder. That's where a lot of aggressive suicide happens. If you hear someone with bipolar has gotten themselves shot by the police, for example, which is called murder by cop or suicide by cop, excuse me, the poor police, what they have to go through, Becky, they're our front line in mental illness right now. And we don't train them enough. Uh, that's the dysphoric mania, which means that you are depressed, but you have lots of energy. So that's euphoric and dysphoric. Now, finally, to your question, bipolar one means that you have all the symptoms of depression, but that you have hypomania, which is a milder form of mania and full-blown mania. So it's about the level of mania. Hypomania is all the same symptoms as full-blown mania, but it just doesn't stay to the point where you get out of control. So you do a lot of crazy things and you can really wreck your life, but you're not to the point where you actually will do things that are are so dangerous that you get put in jail, for example. Full-blown mania, here, this is statistics again, 70% of people with full-blown mania are also psychotic. So bipolar one is hypomania with full-blown mania. Almost always a person with bipolar one will go to the hospital in a manic episode. Unless it's caught early, those are the people who are in your psych wards. They're either there because they're depressed or they're there for full-blown mania. You don't see people with hypomania in the psych wards. I have bipolar two, which means I have a lot of depression, like everybody with bipolar, but my mania stays at hypomania. 
But there is a spectrum. There's a fabulous doctor named Dr. Jim Phelps who created the concept of the bipolar spectrum disorder. PsychEducation.org is his website. And he shows that we actually have a continuum, cyclothymia, the mildest form, and then see it go across and it goes whoop all the way to full-blown mania. In the middle would be bipolar, two, excuse me, bipolar one. In the middle is bipolar two, milder form cyclothymia. And then you move towards bipolar two, all the same depression, but with hypomania. And then as you move up the continuum, you hit all the depression plus full-blown mania. I'm somewhere between bipolar two and bipolar one. I have extremely long and very, very intense hypomania. And the only time I went into full-blown mania was when I used medical marijuana. Marijuana, because of its high THC content, is our number one problem in bipolar disorder today. Marijuana THC, THC. or marijuana CBD? Nope. C- CBDs are why most people smoke marijuana. They're actually trying to eat or smoke to calm down. And the CBD, which is your anti-anxiety, et cetera, the THC, which is the hallucinogenic, The latest study shows, um, just the latest study literally came out last week, that the THC content in today's marijuana, which tends to run around 18%, increases your risk of psychosis by 159%. Wow. It increases the risk of psychosis in someone with a mental illness or increases the risk of- Anybody. Anybody. So you add bipolar to it and you've got, I believe, about a 700%. They usually say sevenfold. So if you take someone like myself with bipolar or someone with schizophrenia, those are the illnesses that have psychosis. We have a sevenfold increase of psychosis. 90% of my coaching now is is pot related. Mm -hmm. It's driving me crazy. Mm -hmm. I teach a class called bipolar disorder and weed. I like to talk to emergency room doctors because they're often frontline. And a friend of mine's an ER doc. And I was asking him, he's like, you wouldn't believe how many hippie types are coming into the ER psychotic because their dealer, whom they've been smoking the same weed for 50 years, literally- the THC is so high, it's making them psychotic. Really great takeaways. Thank you. Now we're going to just hit some quick, curious questions just to kind of wrap it up. So the first thing is, what book, documentary, video, artist, musician, do you most or have you most either gifted or recommended? Without question, The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. The Four Agreements is the best lifestyle book for people with bipolar I've ever read in my life. Because The Four Agreements is a Toltec mystic book. So the beginning of the book is more religious than maybe some people like. So I tell them, read that, do what you want with it. But the four agreements basically teach you how to live a life where your emotions are giving you trouble. Because bipolar disorder doesn't let us choose our own moods, we have to have a set of rules to live by. I live by the four agreements, two of which are don't make assumptions and don't take anything personally. The number one thing that bipolar disorder does is makes you make assumptions about what's happening because you're manic or you're depressed, you're psychotic or your anxious brain says, someone's following me. Someone's doing this. Someone's getting at me. There's a, there's a camera in the corner that's looking at me. He hates me. My manager's going to quit. Those are all assumptions that I step back and I go, I will not assume that's real. So without knowing it, the four agreements gave me a very strong pattern. The first one is don't be a gossip. Be true to your word. Second, don't take things personally. Third, don't make assumptions. Fourth, do your best. In bipolar disorder or in any mental illness, our best must be our goal because we will not be at the level of people who don't have a mental illness in terms of work and creativity. We can't. We, we have way too many illnesses we have to do with. We didn't talk about this, but I was the original consultant for Claire Dane's character on Homeland. Love and that show. I, How do you feel? About- I think in the beginning, it was superbly, very, very well done. And I love Claire Dane. She was very nice to me. And we met and she was absolutely aw- awesome. I watched the show the last year and it was very interesting to me because they are now portraying her bipolar disorder as something that's just dealt with by her taking like one pill. It's changed a little bit. Because you have to do that. I understand it. So I watched the last year very carefully. And for anybody who has not seen the show, I'm not going to give anything away this last year, but the character of Quinn, who got a brain injury, I think they handled that a little bit better than they're actually handling the bipolar. Carrie going through what she goes through is absolutely impossible in bipolar. It's not going to happen. Um, The triggers that she has faced are too strong in the show now. So when they showed her, I think the season the year before, when she went off her meds, they tend to equate bipolar disorder as meds take care of it, off your meds don't. That's not true. Meds take care of about 50% of bipolar. There's a guy named Tom Wooten, and he wrote a book called The Bipolar Advantage. And I always was like, advantage, that's BS. This is a crappy illness. I still feel that. 
But I think Tom's approach and many other approaches, which are, okay, I've got it. It's crappy. It's awful. It wants to kill me. But what has it taught me? So I'm moving a lot more into reading about being somebody who is self-sufficient, where the behavior of others is not my business, where I can have horrific things happen to me and be betrayed or have horrible, just horrible things happen where I have to leave relationships, whatever, but come out of them. I still get sick. I still, the bipolar is always going to show up. It does, but I'm different. I'm a lot more of that word resilient. Mm -hmm. One of a really good treatment that I use is to be by myself in a dark, dark theater because I have to watch a movie. I can't run around and drive too much and that kind of thing. Great suggestions. And just again, all of your recommendations will have a long list of show notes. So people go to the blog and find your show notes. All right. So where can people find you? Where is the best place for people to connect with you on the socials, on your website? Anybody who wants to just hear more about my work can go to juliefast.com. Then my books are sold off of bipolarhappens.com. I have a blog that if you go to bipolarhappens.com and click on blog, it's there. The best place to interact with me, in fact, the only place, because I cannot handle the amount of email or even questions I get, is I do live question and answer sessions on my Facebook page. Basically, if you type in Julie Fast Bipolar, and then I highly, highly want to suggest bphope.com. And that's the website for BP Magazine for Bipolar, and I have most of my writing there. So you can get my first traditionally published book, Loving Someone with Bipolar Disorder, Understanding and Helping Your Partner. My second book, Take Charge of Bipolar Disorder, which is for people with the illness and family and healthcare professionals, and get it done when you're depressed at bookstores and Amazon and libraries. And then the health cards are only available on Bipolar Happens. And then I have a really fun book, my first book I ever wrote called Bipolar Happens, which is just a really fun book that still has hand done graphics in it practically. And that's on Amazon as well. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being here. I'm already going to secure your, our next episode. I'd like to leave with a little bit of advice for people. My illness right now is telling me I was no good on this interview. So I'm hearing voices. And they're saying, you made no sense. Don't ever listen to this. It's not going to work. You were a mess. This is a failure. I can hear them. Anybody with a mental illness knows this. So what I have learned, because in order to be a professional speaker, to move forward with my work, I hear those and I feel them. They feel very real. And those are my stress voices. There is a door behind me. And I made a deal with myself many years ago. Any door that I close after doing a big interview, after being on TV, it closes the thoughts. I no longer take my mental health disorder symptoms out the door with me. I used to do that because I would think, oh my God, I could have done this and I could have done that. As the four agreements said, I can only do my best. I can only be present. I can only listen to your questions and answer them to the best of my abilities. My bipolar wants to turn it into something else. It would even turn it into paranoia if I let it, but I'm not going to. Door shuts, I'm done. And you know what I say? Good job, Julie. Good job, Julie. Julie Fast is a mental health guru and best-selling author. You can find her at juliefast.com. Thanks so much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. Before you take off, I have a quick question and a few more things to let you know about. One. You can find show notes and all resources mentioned at AppliedCuriosityLab.com forward slash blog. And the question, would you enjoy joining the ranks of curiosity seekers and adventurous thinkers? If so, you are invited to join the tribe of the curious. You'll receive Quick Curiosity Monday. This short weekly email is curiosity lube for your brain. It consists of ideas I'm pondering, curiosities the tribe has shared, and things that I'm enjoying that I suspect you might too. Just go to AppliedCuriosityLab.com to join, or you can probably just pick your favorite search engine and type in Tribe of the Curious. And let's connect online at Becky Saltzman on Twitter and on Facebook at Applied Curiosity Lab. Finally, in order to avoid missing insights from outside the boundaries of ordinary, subscribe to Applied Curiosity Lab Radio on iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, and all the other places podcasts hide and wait to be discovered. In the meantime, elevate curiosity.